All right, good morning, everyone. Wow, it's been an amazing weekend again. This, the, this one conference just does not disappoint. I was thinking, gosh, it can't be as good as it was last year, but I think it's been even better. So thank you all for sticking around till the end of the weekend. Um, so this is a session that Steve and Schaefer and Jeremy and I um, thought could be useful for many people in the audience. And I, this is going to be kind of learning how to look at your CGM data. <laughs> if you haven't got the message yet, we think CGM is really important. Um, so this session is really learning how to use your CGM data and kind of look at it in a big picture and then make your own changes. Because I think what a lot of people do is they think that they should go to their doctor's visits or their provider visits and then really after that visit they make a change in their pump and then they don't have to do anything for three months. And diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, is a very different disease where as providers we expect you to manage your disease every day. And perhaps be in a totally different place by the next time we see you in the clinic. So our idea here today is to give you some knowledge and some tools to be able to do that and make your own changes. And this is very different. For those of you that went to Dr. Ponder's talk yesterday, Stephen Ponder's sugar surfing talk, and for those of you who couldn't make it, because I know there were a lot of good talks, it was recorded and it will be on the TCOID website, so you can go ahead and watch it. But his talk is talking about how to kind of stay in the zone on a day-to-day -day basis, like the nitty-gritty of how to move your arrows and keep yourself in the zone. And this is more looking at bigger picture, how to use your CGM by kind of of looking at trends and then figuring out how to make changes. Okay? So we're going to get started. Schaefer's going to walk you through kind of how to initially look at your CGM and what all the data means, and then we'll go through some examples. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so again, this is a little bit of a different approach, and it's, a, it's about a bigger picture look. And so what I want to do is orient everybody to um, sort of this download. And this is, this is sort of a summary download that, as an example from Dexcom. And this is basically um, what we would look at you know, if we downloaded your CGM in clinic. Um, and if you, haven't, if you have a CGM and you haven't gone in and look at these downloads, we encourage you to. Because there's, there's, there's a ton of data to see and to, and to make sense of that goes sort of beyond just what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day changes. So I'm just going to orient you to, to what we're looking at here. So when we're looking at this, there's sort of a pattern that we use to look through each page. And this is, and this is what everything is. So first of all, you'll see um, the, the uh, hopefully we don't have any patient names on here except for this one we forgot to take off. It's like Steve Edelman or Edelman, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, so we got this download and, and um, the first thing that we look at is the average blood sugar, okay? And um, I'm also going to kind of mention some goals, some targets that we generally um, recommend for people. It's important, and I'll just say this once, but it's true for pretty much all of these targets, that different people's targets are going to be different. Okay, So everybody's blood sugar target and every other target in here really should be individualized based on your other health problems, if you have risk for hypoglycemia, um, your age, and all sorts of different things. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some, some targets that we use in a general scale. That doesn't mean they're specific for you, but that's how we look at these things. Okay, so. Average blood sugar, first of all. So this is the average blood sugar or the mean blood glucose over the whole time of this download. And in this case, it was a 14-day download. Okay. So Steve's average blood sugar is 142. And our general goal for average blood sugar in general is under 150. Okay. And that's because that number roughly should correlate with an A1C of 7 or under. Okay. So that's kind of where we get that. So average blood sugar under 150. So Steve's doing great. Right next to the average blood sugar is a number called the standard deviation. And that's a measure of the variability, sort of the highs and lows and ups and downs um, around that average, OK? So and again, our, our, our goal for most people, if, they're, if our goal for the average blood sugar is 150, the goal for the standard deviation is under 50. So the lower the standard deviation, the better, because that means less variation, less ups and downs, OK? So again, um, so Steve's doing good. He's under 50. And the next section here shows the time and range. So Kelly was just talking about time and range. You've probably heard that term a lot this weekend, and, and maybe you, you already know about time and range. But it's a, becoming an increasingly important uh, concept in, in type 1 diabetes. So 
So this is another one more opportunity to talk about it. So time and range, um, uh, basically, uh, on the simplest definition, is the amount of percent of time that you're spending with your blood sugar between 70 and 180. And if you have a CGM, you can go in and you can set your time and range targets. And we encourage almost everybody to set their time and range targets at these numbers, 70 to 180. And that's because um, th th those are basically the numbers that everybody uses in terms of research and guidelines and everything. So it's going to help you basically compare what you're doing to the guidelines of what else is going on in the world. And it's going to help your providers understand what your time and range is. Some people will use different times and ranges and that's okay, but 70 to 180 is the definition. Yeah, so, so sometimes the time and range can be different at night, so where it's a little bit tighter, and I think that's fine. Yeah, so, so I won't get into that, but, but there are some different, you can change it at nighttime. So this is um, uh, just a chart that sort of sh talks about time and range, and some of those numbers might be hard to see. But the, the, basically, the green section in the middle is the target range of 70 to 180. And the goal is to spend 70% of your time or more in that target range. Okay, that's the general goal. And then down below at the bottom, you see this red area, and that's the time below range. Okay, so time where you're, when the blood sugars are under 70, and then there's even a little section at the bottom where it shows blood, time with blood sugars less than 54, so more severe lows. Okay, and the general goal, so traditionally in our group, we've always talked about trying to make that number as small as possible because hypoglycemia is dangerous, it's bad. So we try to make that number as small as possible, and ideally we get, try to get it less than 5%. And some recent guidelines, some consensus guidelines from some other experts have recommended getting that number under 4%. So that's just an idea. We want that number as small as possible, so a, a, a couple percent. And then what's left is the time above range up in the yellow, okay? And that's basically anything left, and that's the, the time above 180. And then there's a section at the very top, which is for, for higher highs of blood glucose higher than 250. So also, as we increase the time and range, we expect that number to shrink because you're gonna have more time at your goal. Okay, so looking at Steve's time and range, time above range and time below range, if we zoom in, this is what we see from this download. So he actually is right at 70% for his time and range and he's got 4% time below range and, and none in that very lower time less than 54. And then what's left over is 26% above range or above 180. And, um, this is a real download, I don't know how he got those exact numbers. But, um, but, but he's doing really good, so he's hitting those targets, okay? And then the last um, sort of section on this page that we look at is this 24-hour multi-day profile. And just to orient you, you don't have to see the numbers on there, but it's really just to look at the, at the shape of this thing, okay? So what that shows us is on the left side is midnight, and then it goes to noon and it goes back to midnight. So it's a 24 hour day. And it's a compression of every single blood glucose that was checked on that CGM over the whole time of the download, okay? And you can kind of see a, a, a black dotted line that runs through the middle. That's the average blood sugar at each of those time points throughout the day. And then there's these bars that go above and below that black line, and that shows the variability at different time points. So the wider those bars, the more variability where there's more highs and more lows sort of running throughout the day. Okay, so just glancing at that, we look for patterns. We can look to see if there's a time in the day when the blood sugar is going high, where it's going low, where there's a lot of variability in highs and lows all together and mixed up. Um, and again, you, look, you know, looking at Steve's, we can find a couple points where we could maybe say, hey, you know, Steve, you're spiking a little bit in the morning. You're more likely to have a little mild low sort of after that spike. He's probably correcting down. So there's some, basically we're looking for patterns and that's how we use that piece of information. Okay. 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 <laughs> this how everybody laughs every time I come to the mic after Jeremy and Steve. Can you guys even see me behind the mic? Okay. All right. So the idea is you guys are very used to looking at your CGM on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of following it. But if you are not doing these downloads, please start doing it. Get a Clarity app if you have a Dexcom. Um, you need to start looking at this data to make patterns. So before we get started, I just want to say that you're all flossom. And what that means is that you embrace your flaws and you know that you're awesome regardless. <laughs> and the, the reason... 
Okay, so the reason I wanted to say this before we get started is that we're going to show you a lot of different real patient downloads today. And I just don't want there to be any judgment because type 1 diabetes is really hard. And you may look at some of these and go, geez, that person's really out of control. And, and you may look at them and say, oh my gosh, mine looks so much worse than that one. How can I ever get like that? And the idea of this presentation is not to make you feel bad about yourself or that you have to achieve any one of these things, but just to know that there's a lot of variability out there with the way diabetes affect people differently. And we're just trying to show you how you, for whatever your patterns are and whatever your difficulties are, how you can kind of stay in that zone and get, spend more time in the time and ranged zone, okay? So let's look at our first case. And I'm gonna present the cases here and then I have Jeremy and Schaefer to comment and Steve to comment as well. Okay, so this is case number one. Again, you're gonna get very used to looking at these downloads just like Schaefer just showed you. So the first thing I would say, and, and by the way, this is kind of the doctor perspective, okay? So I realize that as patients, you may have different perspectives, but we kinda wanna show you what we're looking at and suggestions we would make. So. In this case, you know, initially when I glance at it, I would say, wow, this patient is doing extremely well. So the average blood sugar is 130, 144. The standard deviation is 38. Remember, we want that less than 50-ish, okay? And then the time and range is just below 70%. So not not at goal, but pretty darn close. Like this patient's doing really, really well. But I can tell you what this patient says when they come in to see the doctor and they, despite the fact that their average blood sugar looks pretty darn good, they're really annoyed at this time of day at lunch. And they just cannot get a handle on their lunchtime spike. So despite the fact that their A1C is probably less than seven, um, this can be really frustrating for people. Do you guys ever have that time of day that is so annoying or that one meal that's so annoying? For a lot of people, it's actually breakfast because that's when you're very insulin resistant. So what I would say to this person is, okay, how can I look at that average and think about what changes I could make? So if there's an obvious time of day when your blood sugar is high, then you want to say, is my dose correct? Do I have the right? Have I tried giving a higher dose? for that meal. Um, and was it given correctly? So did I count for all the carbs? Do I need to consider a different type of bolus for that meal? And we're gonna get into that a little bit later, meaning is this kind of a meal that's mixed with fat and protein and you may need to deliver that bolus a little bit differently? Did I give my dose ahead of time? So. Most of the time that I see a spike that where somebody looks really good, but they just can't get a handle on that one spike, a lot of times it's because they really need to pre-bolus for that meal. And they have to give that insulin 20, even 30 minutes ahead of time sometimes. Um, and then the other thing that happens frequently is people just miss their dose. Maybe this is the time of day you just can't get a handle on because it's right in the middle of your work day or it's right in the middle of when you're picking your kids up from preschool and you just cannot get your hands free for a second. Um, so these are just some of the things that you can think about. Any other comments on this case, guys? I, I think, Sasan, can you go back to the tracing? Yes. So just a couple of quick comments. If these percents are confusing to you, you can also kind of mentally convert them to time um, in your head. So for every 4% time in a certain range, that's about an hour a day. <clears throat> so if you're spending 4% of your, of your day less than 70, that means about an hour a day that you're in that, that range. So you can kind of do that if it helps. And then I would say a couple things, yeah. So when you come in with this download, um, let's say this is your download. I know as a patient, like Trish circled this, <clears throat> and you probably all want to immediately explain this away. But first, yeah, focusing on the good things about this. This person probably has a really good A1C, they're doing really well. And just because you're highlighting this one quote unquote bad thing, um, it's just, you know, we're trying to kind of help you with it. But what really is nice about this download is how consistent this person is. So as Schaefer was saying, those little bars around the, the dotted line is kind of how variable you are at these different times. So it's nice that this person actually has a pattern. Um, you know, so there's this one meal that, that with all these tricks that Gary's gonna talk about and Trish just talked about, you can definitely address. And then the other thing is overnight, just noticing that that's kind of constantly creeping up 
um, overnight seems to be a little bit of a pattern also. So maybe adjusting your basal dose or upping your basal rate. So a lot of times we'll see a download like this, but those bars are really big, meaning that at midnight they might be 300 one day and 30 the other day, and it's hard to really you know make a change based on that. But this person is really consistent, which just makes it easy to address you know things. Right. Which another thing is you know this is the other nice thing as a patient to be able to look at these downloads is that. This is not just showing you one outlier where you had a random high one day because you really said F it, like Jeremy said, right? So this is showing patterns. And that's what's so nice, I think, about looking at this data rather than just looking at one day at a time. I'll just add something real quick that um, the standard deviation overall is excellent. But mm -hmm. if you look at your clarity data for this for the Dexcom, you can actually get to the part of the download that gives you the standard deviation per hour. And you could see that, you know, at some times the standard deviation is tight, which is awesome, and then sometimes it gets wider, usually after meals. So I think, you know, it's important you could look at that data. It's on your, your clarity download. You just sort of push to the right. And overall, I think, you know, this, this individual is doing really well. So take a glance at this data here, like Jeremy was talking about how small this standard deviation is, and contrast that with the next one. So what you should be able to see with this case is that during the day, when we look at this kind of big graph here, the standard deviation is pretty small still, right? Can everybody see that? The bars are kind of pretty short here. But look at how different it is overnight. We have these huge bars, lots of high blood sugars, lots of blood sugars kind of borderlining on the low here, but just a lot of variation overnight. I was going to say, this patient is, I believe it's my patient, I can't remember, but she, I believe it's, she's a bartender at night. She's a young, young female, and she just, you know, just has the wildest nights. And if you, <laughs> if you cover up her CGM reading from 7 a.m. and before, you think she's doing really good. Yeah. But all hell breaks loose when she goes to work at, <laughs> you know, 10 p.m. and then works all night. So, um, so you can see that her time and range is 48 percent. Remember, time and range 70 to 180. Um, and a lot of that, you know, the highs, which is this yellow here, a lot of that is coming from overnight. Now, one of the things as doctors, one of the the views that we really love to look at is this, where you can see um, an entire week at a time. And I would say if you guys are looking at this view, don't try and look at more than maybe a week at a time, two weeks at the very most, because all of a sudden it's just going to look like scribble scrabble everywhere and you're not going to be able, unless you're, you've got a really small standard deviation, you may not be able to pick out patterns. But let me show you a couple of things that we figured out with this patient. So first of all, I'll say there may be a lot that we can tackle over here as well, but this is from, just to orient you again, like Schaefer said, this is midnight here. This is 9 a.m., you know, noon, and then back to midnight. So this is 24 hours. Each different colored line is a different day, okay? So I want to highlight a couple of really important things from this patient because I have to say, as a doctor, I see this a lot. So right here, you can see that sometimes this patient actually has a good blood sugar when they go to bed, but then it drops low overnight. And it turns out for this patient, if she goes to bed with a good blood sugar, she will go low at night. She will have a nocturnal hypo, okay? So what she does most nights is she eats and has a snack at night before she goes to bed because she doesn't want to get low. And then she doesn't give insulin for that snack, of course, because she's taking the snack not to get low. And then all of a sudden, this is what happens overnight. Lots of highs. Okay, this is a common thing that I see. And back in the day, doctors used to recommend snacking at night to avoid low blood sugars, actually, which we don't, you should never have to snack your way out of your insulin, okay? So in general, what you can learn from this one, again, I know we could go over a lot of different things here, but some of the take-home points are you shouldn't have to snack at night. And if you do, that means your basal insulin dose or your basal rate on your pump is too high. The point of the basal is you should be able to go to bed with a good, relatively good blood sugar in the zone with a flat arrow and not drop overnight, okay? 
I guess this is not my patient, but it looks very common, similar. But similar, yeah. I was, just, I was also going to say that uh, Gary Shiner is going to be, after our short break, he's going to be talking about striking the spike. So that's, we're going to get a whole uh, different view on how to prevent that spike, which is so aggravating. Yeah, I would say, <clears throat> you know, when we, we go through these downloads, for me, you know, we look at the average, we look at periods of, of hypoglycemia that are, are really critical to address. And then after that, you know, personally, I look at the nighttime, because that's eight hours or so that if you lock that in, you know, you can have good blood sugars for eight hours because you're not eating, you're not exercising, things like that. So when I see patients like this that are having this, um, all these highs at night, it's really unfortunate because that can be one of the easier times to get your blood sugars under control. Um, so really addressing that, and what Trish was trying to you know, is, is saying is that once you get your basal right, you don't really have to mess with it. Um, your basal doesn't change too much year by year. So once you kind of you know, establish that kind of groundwork, then you can address the, the meals and the pre bolusing and things like that. But once this patient gets their basal rate right and doesn't have to snack, all of a sudden that's eight hours where instead of being 300, they're 150, and you can really improve your A1C by, by getting that kind of under control. Agree. All right, here is case three. So this is, let's look at it kind of systematically, how Schaefer taught us to do. So average blood sugar, 98. Wow, that is hard to achieve. Um, standard deviation is pretty low. So this is 34. That means there is not a lot of variability. Um, and you can see that because look at how tiny these bars are here. There's just not a whole lot of variability. But the most striking thing um, for this patient is they're having 24% hypoglycemia. They're hypo 24% of the day. So I want to highlight a couple of things here. Lower average is not always better. Okay, So we want you to get your average low safely. And hypoglycemia is not safe. Okay, so that's per point number one. And then, and I think a lot of people are afraid of complications of, of long-term hyperglycemia. And when I, ha I have quite a few patients like this who are deathly afraid of being high. And if you're one of those people, I just want, I always try and remind people, you know, you have to be really high for many years to develop complications. And hypoglycemia can be extremely dangerous and not to be morbid, but even deadly today, okay? It doesn't take many years. So hypoglycemia is really unsafe. Now one of the first things I look at if I have someone who has a lot of hypoglycemia is their alert settings on their CGM. So for those of you using a Dexcom or Medtronic CGM, you have alerts that you can set. Um, on the Libre, there's not alerts yet, um, but Let's look at the alerts. So for this patient, the low alert is set at 65. And a lot of people think that that's a good place to set the low alert because they say, well, I feel fine in my 70s. I don't want to be alarmed every time that my blood sugar you know, drops below 80. That would be extremely annoying. And what I want to remind you about is that there is a lag. Okay, So when your CGM is telling you that you are, if your low alarm set at 65 and your CGM is alarming, it's saying you're 65, you were 65 five minutes ago, maybe more. Okay, so that means now you're probably 60 or below. So in general, I recommend to my patients to set their low alarm around 75 or 80. It's a safer place to be and it gives you time to do something and with, before you get kind of down to that critical space. So you can eat a little tiny pack of Skittles and not have to eat the whole fridge because you're you know, really dying at that point, right? You're really um, feeling it. And then the other thing is, um, this patient doesn't have their low repeat alarm on, and this is very dangerous. So your repeat is like your snooze button, okay? So some people will sleep through their, some people will sleep through their alarms. Um, and so you want to make sure that that repeat is on because in case you don't respond to a low, you want it to go off again, okay? How, how long? What's, oh, so here, uh, you know, I recommend 15, uh, around 15 minutes or so. Yeah, I'll just add something real quick. You know, when Tricia talked about the lag time, that's really important. If you have two arrows down and you're 65, you're probably 45 or below, you know, 10 minute lag period. And each CGM is a little different. 
And I think the, the repeat high is also important, you know, and I don't know, what do you recommend for that, for the repeat high? What do you guys use, Steve and Jeremy, for two your hours. repeat high? Yeah, two hours. Yeah. Because <clears throat> you want to be alerted again, you know, two hours later, you're still, you know, over 200 or whatever. But can you go back to the tracing again? Yeah. And, you know, this is a, a really common scenario, actually. And I guarantee this person was told they were going to die at age 40 and they were going to lose their legs and all the horrible things. And people get that really beaten into them. And then they just go get obsessive about not being high. And then what can happen is they walk into their doctor's office with an A1C of 5.7 and their doctor tells them, gosh, you're fantastic. You're my best patient. You know, they see them year after year. You're doing a great job. I am much, much more worried about this patient than somebody coming in with an A1C of nine. Yeah. Um, so just because your A1C is good doesn't mean that you're in a safe place. So it's about getting your A1C down as low as you can, as safely as you can. If this person's numbers were all the same, but they were 1% hypoglycemia, I would say, you really are. That is incredible. Um, but often it comes with that trade-off of you're going, you know, pushing your blood sugars down, 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 and then you're low all the time. And one bad low can be a, a big problem. And I would, I completely agree with that. And I would say that of the, pa I, I see a lot of patients with type one diabetes. I rarely find A1Cs less than seven, or maybe less than 6.5 when they're not having severe hypos. So it's just, I think it's getting easier with CGM and especially with looping and all of these other um, devices that we have now. So we'll, we will start to see it. But traditionally, to get an A1C less than 6.5 or so without having a lot of hypos is really hard to do. All right. OK, let's jump to case four. So again, kind of looking at it in our systematic stepwise way, first we look at the average glucose, it's 225, and that actually does correspond to an A1C of about 8.7, which is not a terrible A1C. Um, but you can see the standard deviation is much higher. So the standard deviation is 93. And what that means is the blood sugar is fluctuating 93 points above 225 and 93 points below 225. So that means a lot of fluctuation. Um, and then the time in range is only 36%. So this, when I see this CGM in my office, I go, yes, this I can fix. I feel like I can do something about this. So number one, I would say if this is your average and this is your CGM, I would say don't be afraid to look at this data. Because just because you're not looking at it or just because you're not sharing it with your healthcare provider does not mean it's not happening, okay? <laughs> so, but when we see it, if we actually can see it as a healthcare provider, then we can do something about it, okay? So as you guys, now that you're CGM experts looking at this, you can probably tell that the blood, the, look at how many swings this patient's having. Really high standard deviation and overall high. Here's that um, time and range cutoff bar and you can see that most of the time the blood sugar's above that time and range goal. Okay, and here's the seven day look. Anybody ever seen something like this? You guys, I see this all the time. This is not infrequent, okay? And you, if this is you, you may say, what the hell is going on? I'm going crazy. So I think, I think one of the hardest parts for patients when they see something like this is, can you guys find a pattern? Yeah. I mean, there is no pattern here. It's all over the place. Right? And so when things are all over the place, and Jeremy alluded to this already, the place that I start is figuring out your basal. Okay? Because if your basal is too high or too low, you are never going to get off that roller coaster during the day. So instead of trying to kind of go back and tackle that, all those squiggly lines all over the place, take a deep breath and say, okay, first I'm gonna figure out my basal. The second problem is you need to make sure that you are bolusing your insulin for every meal, every snack. Because oftentimes when we see readings like this, it's because you know, they don't take any insulin here for lunch and then they go up here and then they take, you know, five rage boluses and then they come crashing down and you just kind of end up on the roller coaster because you're chasing numbers all the time. So 
looking at your basal rate first and then um, making sure that you are dosing for all meals. And don't wait for your blood sugar to be 400 to do something about it, right? So if you, go, if you didn't go to Dr. Ponder's talk, I recommend watching it um, on the TCOID website when you get home because he'll talk about ways to kind of never get up there in the first place, okay? So you may say, how do I test my basal? So here are instructions of how to test your basal. First, you're going to have an early dinner. You're going to take insulin for that dinner. And then you want to test your basal on a night when your blood sugar is between about 120 to 180. These are rough guidelines. It doesn't have to be perfect. A couple of hours after dinner. And this is actually important. You want your trend arrow on your CGM to be horizontal. Because if it's going, you know, straight up or double arrows down, that is probably an effect of some food that you ate or some insulin that you took, and it's not really telling you about the basal. Okay, so you want your blood sugar to be kind of in range with a flat arrow. Note what your blood glucose is at bedtime, and then fast until the next morning. And the next morning when you wake up, it should be plus or minus 30-ish, okay, from where you went to bed. So the goal of your basal rate, if you're on a pump or dose if you're not, is to keep your blood sugar relatively flat overnight. So that means if you go to bed with a blood sugar of 250 and a flat arrow, you should wake up around 250-ish, okay? Waking up at 250 in that case is not a basal problem. It's because you went to bed high, okay? So it's very different. Any other thoughts or comments, guys? I think this is this is super important. Yeah, and just doing this over and over again until you kind of get it locked in. And then, like I said, once you get it locked in, you're you're good to go. And then the other thing I want to say about these this pattern is, you know, so we kind of saw the person that's low all the time, and what that person will say is, "Gosh, I hate being high. I, I feel sick or whatever." This person, a lot of the times, I'll, I'll I'll hear them say that they hate being low, that they might have had a bad hypoglycemic event, and they're actually purposely riding mm -hmm. high. Um, you know, to try to avoid those lows. And that's a tough situation to kind of overcome. And if that's your situation, it's just trying to get comfortable with instead of being 250 all the time, aiming for 200 and then aiming for 180 mm -hmm. and just slowly getting more comfortable with tightening things up over time. Um, the, other thing they can, the other thing you can tighten up over time is your low alarm. Yeah. So your low alarm, if you're in that situation, doesn't have to be 80 to start. You know, if you're terrified of being at 80, you can set your low, you can actually set your low alarm higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, you, you may need to do it more than once, test your basal overnight, because that's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't always work out perfectly. The other thing I like to do, and you can all do it yourself, you know how the, the Dexcom says, this is your best glucose day? Take a look at that day, and then look what you're doing that day. And you know, a lot of times you can get an idea if your basal set correctly, your your best day typically will show that. So it's kind of a, a, a quick and dirty, quick look. But testing your basal is key, whether you're on Tujeo, Lantus, Traceba, or or on a pump. And you know, we can talk all day about crazy basal rates we've all seen in, in, in our patients, but we'll save that for later. Yeah, and, and Steve's point about not you know, testing just once, it's really important with all of these decisions that you don't make rash decisions and changes based on one day, right? Because could you, on the day that you're testing your basal, what if you exercised a lot more that day than other days? Or what if you're on your menstrual cycle? Or what if you um, are really stressed at work? So all of these things can affect it, right? So you, this is looking for patterns that Okay, so we wanted to show you uh, what the, a couple of other CGM downloads look like. So we'll get to a couple more. This is the Libre. Um, and what you're gonna notice is that the other CGMs look very similar to the Dexcom. Most of our patients and the ones that we got sent in were Dexcom, so that's why that's the majority of what's that, um, what you're seeing. But for the Libre, you still have similar things here. The average glucose, the standard deviation, the target range. Again, you know, for those of you that have used the Libre, remember you set your target range. So if you set your target range from 70 to 250, it's gonna look like you're in range a lot more than you actually are. Okay, so 
Um, so for this patient, I would point out a couple of things. And this is why we love CGM so much. So let's look at the average blood sugar, 148. That corresponds to an A1C of about 7%, okay? So you may say, this is perfect, but look at the standard deviation. It's 70. So this is why we are teaching you to move away from hanging your hat on that darn A1C that's so annoying and feels like a report card and really look more at your time and range and your standard deviation. Because you can have a great average blood sugar with a great A1C and still have a lot of dangerous highs and dangerous lows. This is another case that's similar. So this is 58% time and range, but you can see pretty good average here, 161, and the standard deviation's a little bit higher at 60. Um, again, this is not too bad, but I just wanna point out that the average is less meaningful when there's a very high standard deviation. So what you can see here is by time of day, the standard deviation is, too bad, is not too bad. You can see a lot of patterns. But you can see even for an A1C of about seven in this patient, they're spending a lot of time above uh, that time and range here. You can see a lot of highs. So pay attention to time and range. This is really the biggest take home from our talk today, not just your A1C. Um, you do also wanna have a high alarm. You know, initially when, I started seeing patients on CGM. I didn't really care about the high alarm that much. I felt like the low alarm was way more important. And the farther along I get, the more I realize the high alarm really is important. It's important for keeping people in range. Because if you're not notified when you're 200 or you know, even setting the high alarm lower than that, that's when you get up to 300 or 400. And we all know that once you get a bear, it's a lot harder to come down without being on the roller coaster the rest of the day. Right? So kind of preventing those highs can be beneficial in preventing lows, actually, as well. A lot of people have their lows from correcting highs. Other thoughts? Jeremy Schaefer. No, I think even in that, that patient, it's still like that was just a classic kind of roller coaster example. And that's why I'm so glad Gary's next, because a lot of staying in range during the day starts with avoiding that post-meal spike. Because if you don't go high after you eat, then you don't have to correct, and then you're less likely to go low and do all that. So you know all the tricks to kind of fight that initial spike just to, to help keep you in range can get rid of a lot of that kind of swinging. Right. Yeah, I just say one quick thing I wanted to say during the session is, you know, all these estimated A1Cs you've been seeing, and I know th these guys have heard me say it like a thousand times, but it's way more accurate than your lab. Kelly uh, alluded to the fact that your A1C in the assay in your laboratory of where you get it drawn may, may not be accurate. You can get many different A1Cs for the same blood sugar. So I think the best thing to do is to download the last two months minimum, maybe three, whatever the average blood sugar is, and you get an estimated A1C is way more accurate than your lab. So we don't have to get, no one has to get their blood drawn for A1C anymore. And we know the A1C sucks. You, you watch that video on our website. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of healthcare providers do not know these details about A1C yet. So, you know, I would just encourage you, don't get hung up on your A1C. Pay attention to your time and range. You know, your A1C, like Steve said, it can be, if you have chronic kidney disease, if you have anemia, if you have several other medical problems, it can actually make your A1C inaccurate. And that can be inaccurately low or inaccurately high. So time and range is much more useful. Yeah, I think if, if you can download this stuff and bring it in to your provider, you may, you, you may be able to teach them about what's going on with your blood sugars. Because some, some endos and even, um, you know, general uh, practitioners or other folks will, will be aware of this stuff and will know it, but not necessarily. So if they're looking just at, at your A1C, they're missing all this too. So, so download it, look at it, figure out what's going on with yourself, look at, see how much time you're spending highs and lows, look at that standard deviation. If your A1C is where you want it, but you're having a tons of peaks and valleys, then there's probably some areas that you can improve. And if your A1C is not where you want it, then you can use this information to kind of get you there. So, so don't be afraid to look at this data yourself and, and spend some time making sense of it because your, your doctor may not. All right, I think we have time for one more case. So this one, we're just gonna look at the uh, week here, 
um, with one day at a time. So this patient said, I only eat twice a day, breakfast and dinner, but my highs from those meals seem to last several hours. Anybody have this problem? Yeah, well, I we, eat for several hours. What's that? I eat for several <laughs> hours. <laughs> um, so for example here, if you look at breakfast, you know, the patient usually eats breakfast and then these highs just kind of creep along for several hours. And I think this is where you should be really paying attention to the meals that you're eating and how they affect your blood sugars. You gotta watch what happens. Okay, I took my insulin dose for that meal. Did it work? How long did my blood sugar stay high? Um, what happened? Did I come down too quickly, et cetera? And what happened for this patient is um, they were eating different types of meals. So I think most of you know that not all food affects your glucose the same. I mean, not all carbs affect your glucose the same. And it depends on whether you eat those carbs with fat and protein or whether you eat the carbs alone. So remember that fat and protein can cause a delayed rise in your blood sugar. And using your CGM, you can look for those patterns. Pay attention to what you ate when you have that. A lot of people, this will happen at dinner where they're bolus for dinner and then all of a sudden, all night long, their blood sugar is just kind of high and rising several hours later. So sometimes this means you have to change the way that you're dosing your insulin for that meal. So if you're on a pump, you may want to consider a square wave bolus, an extended bolus where you deliver the insulin over a period of time. You can do this while you're looping as well. Um, if you're not on a pump, you can consider kind of giving two doses, one up front and then one later, or you can consider using a combination of a Frezza, the inhaled insulin that works really quickly, and then your regular bolus that takes longer. There's lots of ways to do this, but you do want to pay attention to how different types of food are affecting your blood sugars. Any other last comments, guys? I think this is the last case we have time for. I was just going to say that a lot of times uh, people will realize that they do have some gastroparesis. And it, you know, it, gastroparesis isn't yes or no. There's a big gradation. So, you know, some people have it pretty bad. Other people may have it just when you overeat. So it's a good, it's a good way to figure out, you know, how long it takes for foods to be absorbed as well. I, I would just say, <clears throat> like, to, kind of to Schaefer's point, <clears throat> now a lot of times clinics aren't set up to download this stuff. And even when they are, there's so many different programs that can take a long time and they might not have your information. So I often default to looking at the patient's phone and you know, looking at the app and just pulling that up. So being prepared to share that information is, is really, really helpful. Because Steve used to always say, you know, going into seeing your endocrinologist without your blood sugars is like going to see you know, your accountant without your, your tax information. You know, we can't just like know what your blood sugars are. So having that on your phone or printing it out um, is really, really helpful. Yeah, and you know, just to, gosh, I'm really, wow, I'm burning through these mics. Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, I, we really just want to empower you to be your own advocate. This is what TCO Idea is all about, is really you taking control and you taking the reins and you making changes. Don't wait for your provider. You guys have the educational tools to do this. Look for patterns. You have the devices now. The technology's there. And I think all of us, patients and providers, can learn from it. So thank you.